to acknowledge our university and community supporters first. University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics for our organization. I also thank the Stanley U of I Foundation support organization, which provides continual financial support. And I thank today's special sponsors, John Menninger and the University of Iowa Community Credit Union. So I'm uh, very pleased to introduce David Wu and uh, very much appreciate his willingness to speak with us today. He's currently an adjunct lecturer, as I mentioned, with the University of Iowa Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Management and Organizations. He received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toronto and his MBA from Arizona State University. His career has included professional positions with Pratt & Whitney in Montreal as a turbine en uh, design engineer, then six years at the University of Toronto researching aerospace material fatigue crack growth behavior. He was with Honeywell Engines in Phoenix for six years, studying engineering and management roles in research and design. And from 2001 to 2015, David was at Rockwell Collins in management roles, including marketing and strategic development, becoming Rockwell's first Asia Pacific Director of Marketing and Strategic Development. He is focused on numerous domestic and international avionics pursuits, especially China's new commercial jets, Japan's regional jets, plus aircraft programs in Brazil and Canada. Uh, and I am pleased to, there, I hope you will join me in welcoming ICFRC member David Wu. Thank you, Bill, for the kind introduction. And uh, <clears throat> I'm certainly glad to be here. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Ed Zastro for making this possible, and uh, I hope uh, this uh, topic will be of interest to you. As you can see um, on the first slide, on the cover slide here, there are, a couple, there are four pictures of uh, different aircraft. There will be a quiz afterwards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to emphasize that uh, the commercial aircraft industry is very global in nature. Of uh, these four pictures on the uh, top left is the, uh, the new Boeing 737 MAX. That, of course, is uh, produced uh, in, um, in the Seattle area. But the other three pictures represent uh, aircraft from what we would normally consider as uh, emerging countries, emerging nations. On the um, bottom left is a picture of three aircraft from uh, Brazil, uh, from the uh, company called Embraer. On the uh, top right is an uh, aircraft from, from Russia. It's called the Su Sukhoi Superjet. And on the, uh, on the bottom right is uh, an aircraft from China called the ARJ-21. All three, um, the Embraer E-Jets, the Russian Superjet, as well as the ARJ-21, they're all certified and they're all flying today. So this just gives you a little, little flavor of um, the global nature of the, uh, the aerospace commercial aviation industry. Before I get into um, some of the other developments, I, I just want to give you an overview of what the, um, the industry is like. You have, um, typically you would have a integrator such as uh, Boeing or Airbus that uh, puts the whole aircraft together. But there are a lot of people, a lot of suppliers that make it all possible. Um, for example, structures, you obviously need bodies for the, you need wings, you need. And typically in the past, these structures were the responsibility of the integrator as well. But that, uh, that has evolved, that uh, the uh, integrators have now outsourced uh, many of those uh, functions to partners. So the, the structures uh, picture shown there sh um, is, uh, is representative of the uh, Boeing 787. And you can see by the various colors who the uh, structure partners are on the 787 program. Of course, on aircraft, you need uh, engines as well, the propulsion system, you need avionics, and then you have a whole host of other systems that, that make the aircraft as a total system uh, fly. And, and the aerospace, commercial aerospace industry is, is somewhat unique also in that uh, because of the, the very high safety requirements, 
not taught there are very unique certification requirements for for materials for systems for software for hardware and and that uh, is a is a challenge for newcomers to just understand the rules of the game in terms of certification now I'll talk about some of the other challenges that uh, newcomers also face in, uh, in the following slide. Before we get into, um, into some of the specific uh, newcomers, um, I'd like to, to give you a picture of um, what the total market looks like. This is uh, data that uh, it's put forth, what was put forward by, by Boeing. Boeing does this every year. They publish a, um, a report every year called the Current Market Outlook. And it's a 20-year outlook of uh, what, the, what they see as the total world demand for commercial aircraft. So they start off by looking at uh, economic uh, growth projections throughout the world. They look at uh, new aircraft developments. They look at uh, new city period developments. They look at traffic patterns. And then they come up uh, with a forecast and they divide the forecast into uh, two parts. One part is what they call the narrow bodies. So these are the single aisle aircraft, such as the uh, Boeing 737s. And then they have uh, a category called the wide body. Those are typically twin aisle, or could be double decker even. And these are, say, the Boeing 787, the 777, and the 747 would fall into that category. So they, they, um, they come up with uh, projections of uh, where the demand will come from, and as well as the total number of aircraft in each category. So as you can see that um, Asia is, is, um, is probably the, the biggest region in the world where the, where the aircraft demand resides, over 40% for both the narrow body and the, uh, the wide body. And then in terms of the uh, total aircraft demand, they project 28,000 for the narrow bodies and over 9,000 for the wide bodies. And that um, together is uh, 37,000 over 30,000, 37,000 aircraft over the next 20 years. And the, the value of that is uh, almost $6 trillion. So, so this, is, this is one look at the world demand. Um, Airbus in Europe also puts together a similar forecast each year. And, and typically, the two companies agree quite well. And they've sort of formed the basis for at least the baseline for a lot of other variations in forecast. I, I need to emphasize this is a forecast for the total market demand. This is not Boeing's share or Airbus's share or the emerging, emerging uh, manufacturer's <coughs> share, but it's just the total, total market demand. So that, uh, that's a pretty, pretty sizable demand, and, and it's worth, uh, worth a lot of money. I should men mention also that uh, America's aerospace industry is, is very, very healthy, and it's uh, been a net, uh, net uh, from, a, from, uh, from, from trade perspective, there it's a, it's a definitely has been a positive contributor from a trade uh, balance perspective. In addition to Boeing, we have uh, suppliers such as Walker Collins or Honeywell Aerospace that export all over, the, all over the world. So in addition to aircraft, the system exports or product exports also contribute to the very positive uh, trade, balancing trade. <coughs> so given that, uh, that uh, we, we say have uh, a forecast over the next 20 years of uh, 37,000 aircraft, who, uh, who's going to fulfill that demand? So we, we, can, we can sort of um, categorize them into two categories. One is, of course, the, the established uh, manufacturers. And you have uh, Airbus uh, based in Toulouse, France, and that uh, being, being one. Boeing being another. Embraer in Brazil is also established. And then Bombardier in Canada is also always very well established. In fact, if you fly out of uh, Eastern Iowa Airport, most of the aircraft you, you fly on probably from Canada or Brazil, they're, um, they're Bombardier CRJs or Embraer E-Jets. Um, so, so we actually have uh, quite a bit of experience with them in that, in, in that respect. 
But in addition to these uh, established manufacturers, we have uh, emerging manufacturers. We have uh, uh, a company called uh, United Aircraft in Russia. Now, you may not be familiar with, but it's a company that's composed of uh, names like Illusion, like Sukhoi, like MIG, like Tupolev that uh, you may have heard of. So it's a, it's a new company that uh, has been consolidated from the disparate uh, design bureaus as well as manufacturing factories in, in Russia. COMAC in China, which stands for Commercial Aircraft uh, Corporation of China, it's also a new entity and uh, they, are, they have designs for the uh, commercial market as well. Mitsubishi in Japan, uh, Mitsubishi is, has been a long time partner to Boeing as well as to, to Bombardier as well, but they have uh, embarked on a, um, on a design of their own, which is currently in, in flight test. It's a, it's a beautiful regional jet as well. But uh, Mitsubishi's um, scope for, for further expansion may be somewhat limited because, uh, they, because of their partnership with Boeing. And uh, if, if they expand any, f any uh, further up the market, they'll be competing against Boeing, which is uh, also a major, major customer of theirs. So that uh, they're, they're just caught in that uh, conundrum a little bit in terms of uh, how, how they develop if beyond this uh, Mitsubishi regional jet. And then, of course, others. But um, there, there are others that have ambitions, uh, such as India, South Korea, Turkey. Um, but those are a little bit uh, they're a little bit further behind uh, these uh, these three that I, I mentioned, and meeting uh, meeting customer expectations really is going to be be the most important uh, requirement uh, for these emerging customers, uh, emerging manufacturers, and um, and and this is uh, maybe maybe obvious, but uh, it it's it's easier said than done. And, and so we will we'll take a look at that on the next slide here. So from, from a customer expectation perspective, we can, we can look at it from uh, two points of view. One is from the passenger perspective. We, we obviously want comfort. We, 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 I think we all wish these regional, regional jets can be a little wider, right? <laughs> <laughs> so comfort is, is uh, of, uh, of importance and reliability. Yeah. That, uh, so that reliability and safety uh, goes without saying. So from a passenger's perspective, it's, it's relatively simple. But uh, the, the other set of customers for, for the aircraft manufacturers is, uh, is the airlines. The, uh, and of course, airlines have uh, a lot more demands. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for aircraft performance foremost. It's got to be able to, uh, to meet its intended mission, for example, to fly from Cedar Rapids to Moscow, for example, should that become a city pair. Mm -hmm. uh, so aircraft performance is, uh, is of uh, paramount importance. Uh, fuel efficiency, uh, of course, it, that, uh, the, and the um, fuel efficiency as well as the uh, environmental impact, they go uh, hand in hand. Pricing is always important. And then reliability, this, especially dispatch reliability. You want the aircraft to be, a, to be a tool, you don't want it to be a hangar queen, so that uh, the aircrafts can be generating revenues for you. So reliability is important. And then the support network, of course. I mean, I, on a previous slide, I had shown that uh, the, the supply chain that goes into building an aircraft. And so you gotta, the aircraft manufacturer has to be able to organize the, um, the various suppliers as well as itself in, in providing a very comprehensive support network so that uh, if things do need uh, attention, that uh, it can be addressed very quickly. So the support network includes things such as uh, repair manuals or maintenance manuals. It includes spare parts, includes uh, flight, uh, flight crew training and maintenance personnel training, includes uh, maintenance centers and field service engineers and a whole host of other, other functions. So the, the building the, the right aircraft, meeting the performance, fuel efficiency and price point requirements those are difficult, but uh, those are perhaps not the most 
difficult for the emerging manufacturers. It's the dispatch reliability and the support network that uh, really will determine whether the aircraft be accepted by the uh, mainstream uh, airlines. I've, uh, I've heard uh, from a uh, um, aviation industry executive in China say that uh, Boeing has really spoiled the airlines in China. He said, well, they don't really have to be that good <laughs> because they set the bar so high that in order for the, uh, for the, uh, for the in-country manufacturers to compete, you know, they, they, it's such a high bar they need to be able to, uh, to achieve in, in terms of meeting the airline requirements. And if airlines, of course, airlines, they may be directing these emerging countries, they may be directed to buy from the in-country manufacturer. But if, they, but if they can't perform, the airlines would say, you know, they, they don't perform. Our customers, our passengers aren't happy. So, so typically, a lot of times that what happens is that uh, they buy, they say order a few, they fly them for a few weeks and they say, well, it's not good, it's not good enough. So, so they keep on buying from Boeing and Airbus. So that's, that's kind of the, the advantages that the emerging, um, the, the established manufacturers have, is that they have good products, they have good support network, and they're able to keep the, uh, the passengers and their airlines happy. So with that, we'll um, have a look at uh, who's uh, on top of the, uh, the hill right now. The Airbus and Boeing are really the, the, the only two players in town right now in terms of uh, mainline uh, aircraft. They, they essentially join, enjoy a duopoly and they both have uh, aircraft families that really span the most profitable uh, market segments. And, and they, they both have, uh, just so happens, they both have four aircraft families. Um, the Airbus has the A320, the A3, A330, A350, and the A380. So those were the four families. The A380 is a double-decker. It's a fabulous aircraft, but it's not doing that well commercially because the aircraft is a little bit too big. And the, um, the airline city pairs have evolved that uh, you don't necessarily have to fly from hub to hub anymore. You can fly from secondary airports to secondary airports. So the Air Airbus A330 and A350 are actually doing better. And that was a, a disagreement between Boeing and Airbus in, in the their Fort market forecast a few years back. That Airbus believed in bigger and better aircraft, and Boeing believed in um, more more direct city pairs with smaller aircraft. And uh, that uh, prompted the uh, the Boeing 787 uh, family development. So speaking of Boeing, they have, they have the Boeing 737 family, which, which, is, which is pretty old. If you look at uh, just the 737 name, it's pretty old. I was still in primary school when the aircraft entered service. 787 is a brand new family. The 777 is a fairly new family. The 747 also dates back quite a ways. It uh, cert first, first certified in the, uh, in the 70s, but it's still in production today. So, so essentially, the, um, these two companies have the, the market cornered. If you look at the Russians on paper, they still have, uh, on paper, they still have uh, a whole range of aircraft, uh, but most of the aircraft uh, in, for example, the Lucian 96 or the Tupolev 204 that uh, compete against uh, these Airbus and Boeings, they are not in production anymore. They may be available as special government aircraft, but they're not competitive against the Boeing and uh, Airbus offerings. But they are making a comeback, the Russians are making a comeback, so, so I'll cover that later. So in the regional jet market, as we mentioned, that uh, most of the aircraft that flies out of the Eastern, Air, Eastern Iowa airport are, are regional jets, and most of them are flying from uh, Bombardier and Embraer. Um, the Ember Year family consists of uh, three members right now that's in production and uh, the passenger accommodation range from from about uh, 75 to to about 135 and Ember Year made a made a conscious decision to stop at 135 
because ab above 135, you're, you're encroaching into the uh, Boeing Airbus territory, mm -hmm. and so that uh, they don't they don't didn't want to draw the ire of a uh, Boeing Airbus. <laughs> Now on the uh, on the uh, on the Canadian side, the, the Bombardier, they are a little more ambitious, and uh, I'll show you some of the pains they got into because of that. They they actually currently have uh, three families. They have a turboprop, the Q400 turboprop that uh, we don't see around here, but on the, on the west coast, uh, Alaska Airlines um, flies flies them quite a bit. In the CRJ family, we see them uh, in the Eastern Iowa airport quite a bit. And then just the recently certified uh, C-Series. The C-Series is uh, actually a family of two aircraft that spans uh, 110 passengers to about 160 passengers. So that encro encroaches into the uh, Boeing and Airbus territory. and. Um, it also points out uh, just how expensive and how resource intensive any new aircraft development is. Bombardier is a big company. It's a, it's a, it's a $5 billion company a year ending annual sales. But uh, if you look at um, the resources they had to put into developing the uh, C-Series and the pricing pressure they faced from Boeing and Airbus, that uh, it must almost put the uh, company um, into bankruptcy. And so the C-Series right now uh, is uh, actually the majority of the program is actually owned by the uh, Quebec government and the Canadian government. It's kind of like GM and Chrysler during the uh, financial crisis that, uh, they, that uh, Bombardier couldn't proceed to certification and manufacturing without government support. And uh, so that uh, is kind of a kind of a lesson for for the newcomers. There's a there's a joke in aerospace industry. How do you uh, how how do you become a millionaire? How? Well, <laughs> I'm glad you 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 asked that question. You start off being a billionaire, and you end up being a millionaire. <laughs> it's hard to make money in the aerospace industry, but if if you're successful, if you're passionate about it, it's a fascination fascinating industry to be in. So, so we've talked about the uh, the established players. Now let's uh, turn our attention to to Russia. Um, Russia, after the demise of the uh, Soviet Union, really went through a r rough patch, and uh, their commercial aircraft production, as you can see by the numbers here, it's it's just uh, it's a precipitous drop from from 715 in 1990 to four in year 2000. So the, the industry basically disappeared and uh, partially, it was partially due to the fact how the industry was structured, that uh, you had, uh, nobody, there, was, there wasn't anybody in charge per se, except the Ministry of Central Planning, that uh, you had design bureaus designing the aircraft, you have aircraft uh, manufacturing houses that manufactured the aircraft, and you have uh, supply suppliers that supply the components. And some of these uh, companies were in different parts of the, the old Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, that the supply chain collapsed and support collapsed. And, and so, so the industry basically um, fell, fell into disrepair to say the least. But uh, more recently, that uh, the the government, the uh, the Russian government, has taken steps to to resurrect uh, what uh, used to be, uh, you can say, prior to Russia as well. That uh, they formed this United Aircraft, and uh, so under United Aircraft banner, <coughs> they have two new two new pr uh, projects that are currently um, one is certified and one is uh, one is in in the um, development stage. So the first is the um, United Aircraft or Sukhoi Aircraft's um, Superjet. And uh, it has uh, extensive Western, Western content. And um, it's certified, it uh, development formally launched in 2003 and, and entering the service was 2011. And to date about, uh, about 100 aircraft have been developed, delivered both in Russia and outside of Russia as well. So it's, um, it's still not at the same stage of acceptance as the Embraer's or the Bombardier's, but they are, um, they are making some progress. 
The other aircraft that's being uh, developed right now is called the uh, Irkut uh, MC-21. It's a, it's a mainline aircraft and that's uh, designed to challenge the uh, Airbus A320 family and the Boeing 737 family. It uh, was launched in 2009 and last year it uh, was rolled out and, and the picture at the bottom right is the, uh, is the picture from the uh, rollout ceremony. And the success again of um, of the MC twenty one is still still mm -hmm. to be determined because uh, just the how how established the Boeing Airbus platforms are. In China, there's uh, there's kind of a similar story, but the um, but their commercial aircraft industry is is uh, didn't go through the same turmoil that uh, the the Soviet unions did. Um, they had uh, the designs of a, the lush, of a, a lot of the Soviet designs. The, they had a lot of the design of Soviet aircraft. And what what the first step they took was to try to modernize those with, with uh, Western content. So the picture on the top right is a aircraft called the MA-60. It's a old uh, Ukrainian design, actually, Antonov-24. And, but it's got uh, Western engines, uh, Pratt Whitney engines, uh, Rockwell Collins avionics. Uh, it's got uh, Hampton Sandstrand APU Honeywell, Honeywell uh, ground proximity for warning system. It's got a West, lot of Western content, but it still doesn't sell very well because the, first of all, the aircraft is um, is an old design, so it's kind of heavy, so it, it doesn't compete well against the um, against Western offerings. And then the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the support network it really, really isn't there. It's really not up to par. So, but similar to the Russians, um, the the Chinese uh, decided if we are going to be serious about uh, commercial aircraft, we need to 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 have uh, a focused effort. And so, this company, Comac Commercial Aircraft Corporation in China, was formed. And uh, similar to the Russians, that uh, there, there are two projects that uh, have been launched under COMAC. The first one is the ARJ-21, which is a regional jet. Again, everybody starts off being a, with the regional jet with the, to get some experience, and then they, go, they, they hope to, uh, to move up, up market. And uh, the uh, ARJ-21 was launched at the same time as the Russian the, uh, the Superjet. But it entered in service much later. It's just uh, it's a reflection of a much more <laughs> difficult time the Chinese COMAC did had in terms of uh, getting the aircraft certified and getting this, all the systems to work together. The COMAC C919 is uh, the aircraft that's under development right now, and it uh, launched around the same time as the uh, the Russian MC21. And again, the service entry into service will, it's still somewhat to be determined. Neither aircraft has entered into a flight test uh, phase yet, but uh, both have been rolled out in terms from uh, at least a ceremonial perspective. So, so as you can see that uh, the Russians and the Chinese, they have had long, they have launched programs roughly around the same time frame. So that brings up an uh, interesting question. So if what, uh, what would, uh, would it make sense for, the, for them to, to pool their resources? And uh, there, I think there are many, uh, many considerations uh, to that question. From a uh, geopolitical perspective, um, Russia and China, they have been inching closer together. Uh, partially due to due to the fact they they both feel that uh, perhaps uh, U.S. and and Western Europe are trying to to kind of contain their contain their growth, so it's uh, it would be a it'd be a kind of alliance in the uh, in the commercial domain. From a capital efficiency standpoint, it certainly would make sense instead of having duplicate uh, efforts, you can combine resources. And then from an industrial base perspective, obviously it would make sense as well as uh, they would uh, both be able to keep on moving, moving up market and potentially uh, challenge uh, Boeing Airbus at some point with the next generation aircraft technology. So, so at least from these three perspectives, uh, it does make sense. And 
lo and behold, there is such a program. <laughs> so the uh, so the the program that uh, the two 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 companies and the two governments have entered into, or they 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 have stated the intent to enter into, but they the the uh, the company itself has not been formed yet. But the program, it uh, it's a kind of a it's a it's a mouthful. It's called the uh, Long Range Wide Body Commercial Aircraft. So even as an acronym, L R W B C A is <laughs> it's still a mouthful. <laughs> so it's a it's a twin aisle aircraft. It's wide body, and it's uh, designed to to challenge the Airbus A three thirty A three fifty family, and the Boeing seven seven um, seven eight seven and the triple seven family. <laughs> So they, the, it's uh, envisioned to be a 50-50 joint venture between, between Comac and uh, United Aircraft. It's being talked about as a potential joint venture for at least two years, but they still have not uh, been able to, uh, to actually formally uh, establish the joint venture. As you can imagine, that uh, there was there's a lot of uh, Horse trading that has to take to to take place. Who's going to do what? Uh, who's going to contribute money? Who's going to contribute technology? So on and so forth. It's envisioned to be headquartered in Shanghai. So, so at least they have decided on where the headquarters and final assembly line is. And at the very top level, they have decided that the uh, the United Aircraft uh, will contribute the wing. And the Chinese side will contribute the fuselage, but there's a lot more details, obviously, that needs to be that needs to be uh, worked out. And the supply base is going to be very complex as well. And so you have the Russian suppliers, you have the Chinese suppliers, and you have Western suppliers. Um, um, I, I should have mentioned that uh, in the um, in the COMAX C919 case, um, the Western suppliers that were selected were required to form joint ventures with Chinese partners. <coughs> so you have those joint ventures that are potentially p players as well for, for this program. And then um, in, on the other side, you have uh, joint ventures on the Russian side, a lot of times with the uh, Western European suppliers. So the supply base is going to be very complex. So the execution of this program no matter at the top level how, how logical it may sound, the, the execution of this whole program will be, uh, be very, very difficult. Here's a, here's a picture of a model of uh, this aircraft uh, that, was, um, that was shown at the, um, the uh, at an air show in China in November of 2016. And that's when some of these top level arrangements were announced as well. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, from model to reality, that's it's going to be a long road, long road ahead. I think my time is almost up, but uh, I, I just have some concluding thoughts that, uh, that I would share with you. The um, first of all, that uh, I think we we all understand how global the commercial aircraft industry is, and going forward, uh, this global nature will become even more so. And that's just the, uh, that, that would just be the, the, the industry trend that uh, is not going to slow down in, 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 in any way. We can say that uh, with high degree of confidence that uh, the Russians' uh, effort to try to reestablish re its former stature with commercial aircraft, it's a work in progress. And similarly with China. China now has uh, now it's the second largest uh, economy in the world and is trying to get more respect. And aviation is one of those glamour industries. It's where it's trying to get uh, some some uh, recognition, but it's also a work in progress because uh, the the bar, as I mentioned earlier, the bar has been set so high by the by the uh, by Boeing and Airbus. With both of these countries, the, the, I think the f we can all agree that fundamentally, the question is not uh, if they will get there. The, the question is uh, when they will get there. And that's the million dollar question. So if you're a businessman, that uh, if you're going to invest in, say, Chinese or Russian programs, you know at some point they'll be successful. But the question is, when will they be successful? Is it 50 years, 100 years, 20 years? So that's the big question. 
and a big challenge really for the Western industry um, for companies such as Rockwell Collins or Honeywell or Pratt Whitney is that uh, how do you how do you position yourself to be um, to achieve a win-win that uh, do you how do you how do you support your current customers such as Bombardier, Embraer, Airbus and Boeing and so that uh, they're happy with your support and they're not upset with you for for looking say further 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 ashore um, while positioning yourself for what uh, as at, at a future date will be probably become a reality further down the road but so that's the balance, you know, the short term and the long term. How do you strike the, the appropriate balance? That uh, is always the question to be asked. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, I'll start off with some general questions. So what is the organization that certifies aircraft? Uh, and uh, what process does the US military use to get its aircraft? So the uh, certification agencies um, in, in the United States, it's uh, the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA. In Canada, it's Transport Canada. In Europe, it's, um, it's um, a, a entity, the acronym is uh, EASA. I think it's a European Aero Aviation Safety Association, something like that. <laughs> but but the, the, the uh, gold standard is the uh, FAA and EASA. So, um, so the, when, the, um, when the newcomers uh, come on the scene, they always have the objective to not only achieve their in-country certification, but to be able to achieve uh, uh, FAA and EASA certification as well. As far as the military is concerned, they have a different, totally different uh, certification um, path, and uh, that would be uh, through through the. Um, I don't know that for sh for I don't know what the agency is for sure, but perhaps uh, you know better than I. But uh, the. But the, uh, the, certainly the, you have to go through the, uh, the, the, for example, if it's an Air Force aircraft, the, the Air Force, their, their mill standards that uh, whatever aircraft uh, the, the Air Force is procuring has to meet all the mill standards for the, for the, for the aircraft. And there is uh, probably a, a central agency where that's in charge of the certification, but uh, I don't know the name of that. Whatever happened to Douglas and Lockheed as aircraft companies? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, the Lockheed and, and Douglas were, uh, were both uh, very prominent uh, aircraft manufacturers. Uh, Lockheed uh, exited the commercial aircraft industry after the L-1011. That was a, uh, a trijet, a wide-body trijet that was, uh, that was not uh, successful commercially. Uh, Douglas now is part of uh, Boeing, Boeing Commercial. Um, the last Boeing, or the last Douglas design to be produced by Boeing was the uh, Boeing 717, which uh, started its life as uh, the MD-95, McDonnell Douglas 95, with, but uh, it traces its heritage actually all the way back to the DC-9 series. All the other Douglas designs are now out of uh, production. The MD-80, MD-90s are out of production. The MD-11s out of production. And only one Douglas design got, uh, after the two companies merged, uh, carried a Boeing, Boeing model number, and that was the Boeing 717 I mentioned. So um, when you talk about Western content, uh, what does that mean? Uh, are the parts made in Western countries? Is that the idea? Western content, uh, Western content can, have, uh, can have various meanings, like uh, the ARJ in, in, in China. Even the aluminum was uh, imported from, from Alcoa. So, so that would be, be um, again, because of certification requirements. And then, so on one, on one level, you can talk about, uh, say, raw material almost, like uh, aluminum sheet metal. 
On the other hand, you have uh, sophisticated systems such as the uh, integrated avionics on ARJ-21 from, uh, it's from Rocco Collins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, right? <laughs> and then you have uh, engines. Engines on the ARJ is from uh, General Electric. Uh, the uh, APU system, auxiliary power unit system is from uh, Hamilton Sunstrand. And uh, so you, uh, and the landing gears are, um, are from a European supplier, um, Liebherr, I, I believe that was. Uh, do you have any thoughts of, about the evolving Internet of Things and the aircraft industry? Uh, Internet of Things, yes, it, it is a hot topic in the aerospace industry as well. Um, so the, um, the commercial aircraft industry tries to to um, think about it in, in terms of two domains. One is a kind of an open domain for the passengers, that uh, the passengers want connectivity, they, um, the, and, and, the, um, and the cabin services also has to be connected uh, so, that, uh, so that passenger connections and all that can be facilitated easily. So that's the open domain. Um, and then there's the safety um, critical domain that uh, deals with communication and control of aircraft. They want uh, that to be to be closed off, to be accessible uh, via secure means only, so that uh, you don't uh, you don't have accidents that uh, don't need to happen. So Internet of Things is uh, it's evolving. Um, aerospace would not be kind of the leading actor in that in that field. But it, uh, in general, it's following the developments very closely. Uh, so this questioner uh, returns to the point you made about uh, the non-US uh, aircraft being the primary regional carriers that we use here in Cedar Rapids and other regional markets in the US and asks, uh, can you explain why that happened, why uh, Boeing, for example, doesn't have more of that? And do you think the new uh, US presidential administration will try to apply pressure to alter that situation? Well, I'll answer the easy part first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, um, it's, it, it really, I think, is due to historical developments that uh, the, um, and, and uh, the fact that the regional market is just not very, not as profitable mm -hmm. as the mainline market. Um, we have in the U.S., for example, uh, Beechcraft in, in Wichita, Kansas, they, they dabbled uh, in um, building regional aircraft, but it was never a big part of their business. Their, the big part of their business was, uh, was business uh, turboprops. And the, the, way, the way the CRJ regional jet evolved was that uh, they, had a, um, they had a business jet, which, um, and the fuselage was, they felt was wide enough to seat four cross. And so, so the, the first CRJ series, um, the 15 passenger vari variation, was basically a stretched business jet. And so they, they had something readily available. And, um, and they saw, at the time, regional aircraft were all turboprops. They saw a potential uh, growth opportunity with jets, and so so they grew into that. Now, why Boeing is not in a regional uh, aircraft business? They they it, I think it's primarily due to profitability. They actually owned uh, the uh, part of uh, Bombardier's business at one point. Bombardier's uh, regional business is uh, part Canadair that's based in Montreal, part De Havilland that's based in Toronto. Boeing actually owned the uh, De Havilland operations for a number of years, and uh, but they they just didn't see the profitability <laughs> in the regional aircraft, so they rather focus on their uh, on what they're good at and what's the more profitable niches. In terms of um, in the current political environment, I, I don't really see the um, see any changes. Uh, at least I can't foresee any changes with respect to regional aircraft because um, the, the companies in the U.S. just are not interested for various reasons for due to profitability or due to, I mean, they, it's, it's kind of, in, from Boeing Airbus's eyes, it's kind of scraps, table scraps that uh, the other people can fight over. So, so, that, uh, so I don't see uh, President Trump uh, making a big push in, into that, into that uh, segment. 
Okay, a set of uh, some just basically factual questions, I guess. What's the uh, cost of a typical wide-body aircraft? What's the typical lifetime of a commercial aircraft? And uh, what do you see as, uh, what would you estimate would be the increase in the number of airplanes uh, in the 20-year perspective you described, uh, factoring in the retirement of older jets? The, uh, the, price, the price points of these aircraft, uh, um, you, you, you have to be a little careful always um, with the price points because uh, the um, manufacturers, uh, they, they say post a catalog price, but when airlines actually buy them, there's, a, there's usually a heavy discount. But uh, the Y bodies, uh, they, their, their, their price points are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So they are, they are very pricey pieces of hardware. And, um, and selling one of these, I mean, is, is, uh, is, is meaningful contribution, just a single aircraft's meaningful contribution to, a, to a, say, Boeing Airbus's profitability. What's the next question? Oh, uh, the, life, the life, life span. Yeah, the lifespan. The lifespan of aircraft can vary in that uh, the, um, if you look at, if you, many of you will probably remember Northwest Airlines before it was acquired by Delta. They, they flew DC-9s into the Eastern Iowa airport <coughs> until fairly recently. Now almost nobody else f flew DC-9s, but but uh, Northwest still did. So as long as you um, carefully maintain your aircraft, they can they can last f forever, essentially forever, as long as you replace the life limited parts uh, as required. That uh, you follow all the uh, maintenance required maintenance, and uh, the um, there's now um, a philosophy called unconditioned maintenance so that uh, the maintenance intervals can be extended or shortened depending on the condition of the, uh, of the component or aircraft uh, that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So the, the typical lifespan would be 20 years, but uh, if, you're, if you're frugal um, like uh, Northwest was, or, or Delta, Delta is still a very frugal uh, airline, you can, you can extend the life quite, quite significantly. Um, how big an issue is industrial espionage in this industry? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, uh, it, is a, it is an issue. It is an issue in that uh, when you have something and, uh, and when you have something that uh, is profitable, it's prestigious. And if you're, if you're an emerging player and you don't have it, obviously there's an incentive to, uh, to get it uh, either through legal means such as licensing or illegal means uh, through hacking and that type of thing. So it is, um, it is, um, it is a fact that uh, it does occur, and companies do take precautions. Um, so that um, some the I mentioned that, for example, with the with the COMAC programs in China, that uh, the government required the formation of joint ventures. So you can be sure that uh, with, within these joint ventures, what uh, the partners have access to are only what they're supposed to get and nothing beyond that. And you have to be very careful in terms of uh, how you partition off your information, information technology system, how you partition off your um, available um, knowledge or, or uh, codes. Um, it is a it is a fact of life that uh, that um, Western Western manufacturers have to pay attention to that uh, it does occur. How close are we to an industry standard of passenger cabs that could be ejected and safely landed in the event of an emergency? <laughs> <laughs> I I think we're quite a ways off. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, do you have any uh, comments on uh, new ultralight materials uh, for the outer skin of aircraft, uh, both in terms of uh, fuel efficiency and safety? Yes, the, um, <clears throat> the materials, aircraft materials have undergone um, many changes over the years. The, um, the, the, the very early airplanes were actually made out of wood, and then they were made of, made of uh, aluminum. 
And now more and more so, the aircraft fuselage is uh, constructed of uh, composite materials, graphite, reinforced uh, plastics. And then so um, we have seen evolution in aircraft materials. And uh, so that contributes <clears throat> to the uh, fuel efficiency of the aircraft. And then that, that is why also why some of the uh, old Soviet designs are no longer competitive because they were still, you know, designed in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Okay, so we'll make this the final question, and, and I'll read it. Uh, hi, Dad. Uh, <laughs> how do photographers take pictures of planes flying mid-air? Does a photographer fly in another plane next to the subject plane? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the uh, and there are pictures of uh, there, are, there are many pictures of aircraft on the ground, but they're just not as glamorous, right? <laughs> that if you were to look at an aircraft on the ground versus uh, aircraft in air, the in air pictures always look better, and they do have chase planes that uh, are are their purpose is to to take these glamour shots of aircraft, and they're they're actually having accidents because of uh, because of uh, these glamour shots. Um, I can't remember the exact year it took place, but in, I believe it was in the early 70s. It, it was actually a, a kind of a parade of uh, military aircraft, and um, they, were, they were posing for, for photography. And um, unfortunately, uh, the wings touched and, and uh, led to an unfortunate accident. But uh, it's, it's the cost of marketing, I guess, that uh, you, they have to pose for these uh, glamour shots. All right, well, let's once again thank David Wu for his very interesting presentation. Thanks once more to our sponsors, U of I International Programs and the Honors Program, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization. Today's special financial sponsors are John Menninger and the University of Iowa Community Credit Union. Thanks again to City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Uh, Dave, as a small token of our appreciation, I'm happy to present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you again for joining us. We are adjourned.